according to Blue Sign and Schwartz, when a relationship breaks up, it's generally the more attractive one that leaves, which I agree with some I agree with somewhat and uh, it's generally the more attractive one that leaves, which why not just get a divorce? Why not just walk away? Take bank Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science. To understand the Watts case and to further understand why, we have to understand the emotional narrative surrounding this case. Not our emotions, theirs. Although this is an important conversation, it's also important to have this conversation in an intelligent and reasonable way. Whether we admit it or not, everyone interested in the Watts case is extremely interested in Nicole Kessinger. If there are those who hate Chris Watts, there seem to be legions more who despise the mistress, many putting all the blame on her for what happened. On Crime Rocket, the stats speak for themselves. Stories or analysis featuring Kessinger are far more popular than the other stories, and those simply featuring photos or footage of Chris's mistress are the most popular of all. Why? People want to see what she looks like. People want, wanted to get to know her and try to understand what what saw in her. Many have looked scornfully at the footage, comparing Shanann favorably to Kessinger or Kessinger unfavorably to Shanann. In this episode, we want to provide some intelligent analysis to a debate that I believe is important but it's important we conduct it intelligently, which is to say using objective facts, using logic, using intuition and sensitivity in some true crime rocket science. Now please understand this. We still do need to be mindful that Shanann is tragically no longer with us. And we do want to be mindful that no matter what the problems were in her marriage or in her life, no one deserves to be murdered for whatever reason. That's not what we're talking about here. So when we're having this conversation, we're not even thinking about that. We're thinking about the relationship dynamics when Shanann was still alive, going back several years into their marriage. What was it like then? What made Chris Watts fall out of love with his wife? What attracted Watts to his wife in the first place? How did the marriage work at a certain point and then how did it not work? And then what attracted Watts to Kessinger and Kessinger to him? And who ultimately was the more attractive partner? In the video posted recently about motive, we looked at the short, thin slicing answer to this question, and then we looked at the longer version. That doesn't quite translate in this area because we, in, in this uh, area it's far more to do with emotions and it's far more subjective. Even so, we're going to do something similar here, but in a lot less detail on both counts. Let's start with a longer, more general version of why couples break up and marriages don't last. We'll then examine the stresses on the Watts family, uh, anchoring our questions and our um, analysis in the discovery, uh, and then move on to Kessinger versus Shanann. Worth playing for? All right, so. The f in the first section we're going to deal with um, a book called American Couples written by Blumstein and Swartz and I will explain a little bit later why this particular book and why Blumstein and Swartz are relevant. Um, they're actually very relevant but just um, 
just take my word for it at this point that that's the case. Uh, I don't want to explain right now why that is. I w I'll do that in a second. So we're going to look at money, work, and sex as the sort of core areas to examine um, compatibility and issues of incompatibility. So um, this is the trifecta that couples need to get right in order to have a longer marriage. In the Watts case, speaking in general terms, both seem to have screwed up their money situation and neither had stellar careers. If they had, the money situation wouldn't have been as bad as it was. They'd gone bankrupt in 2015, but somehow they hadn't learned the lesson from that catastrophe. Or perhaps one of them um, had learned the lesson. I do want to emphasize that even though the financial malaise uh, in the Watts family was joint, um, I don't think it was shared, I, I don't think the responsibility for the, their terrible finances was um, shared equally and there are many reasons for this. Um, a, a few of them are to simply say how much money was Watts earning and how much money was Watts spending, right? Compared to how much money was Shanann earning, really earning, and this is a huge unknown still in this case. There are many people who assume, I believe falsely, that Shanann was successful, that she was making a lot of money, that um, she was even earning more than he was. I don't believe that. Um, I believe that's a strong perception, uh, but I don't think that's true. And then there's also, um, you know, how much was she spending relative to her husband? Bear in mind, just, just if we look at the um, last six weeks, um, you know, who was in at home in Colorado sort of working? and who wasn't. Now you can sort of even take that both ways. You could say, well, Shanann was working hard, she was working away from home, but she could have worked at home and that would have been cheaper. Um, there's also the aspect of, um, you know, what's was spending money on an affair, um, you know, wasn't that a waste of money? We can compare that to taking flights to um, thrive, um, what do you call it? thrive events and um, you know I think if one did the sums and, and it might actually be useful to do that if one did the sums and one looked at the cost of a flight to say um, Phoenix the last flight and then we look at the cost of Watts's meal with Kessinger and, and just add up all those expenses you know him going camping with Kessinger and Shanann going to um, San Diego uh, and what did they get out of that all that kind of thing Shanann obviously went with her husband to San Diego but her husband was kind of he's not it's not really his business he's got another job so one could even argue that that was uh, unnecessary one can say one can argue well the flights were paid for the accommodation was paid for you can make that argument but then you can also say well how come they were in such financial difficulty so I think as soon as we look at this both in the general sense but also in the specific sense I think we we need to tie it down to the discovery and the narrative itself um, I think it's important that we don't just pontificate off the top of our heads and say maybe this maybe that um, and so let's do that um, there are seven references to bankruptcy in the discovery documents Actually, there are a few more, but those references are in Kessinger's uh, Vodacom cell phone report, and that's sort of the fine print of it. So it's not technically part of the discovery or, or what the people have spoken about. Um, ironically, most of these references come from Nicole Kessinger, not from Chris Watts, not from Shanann, not even from their friends. So the first reference is where Kessinger says Chris never discussed his bankruptcy with Nicole. He said Shanann spends most of the money and he was frustrated that Shanann had bad spending habits. Now when we're talking about, 
about these references to bankruptcy they are references to the fact that bankruptcy wasn't talked about I just want to be clear on that um, what's interesting is that Nicole was aware of the bankruptcy but she, and she was also aware that it was wasn't discussed by him um, so even though she was aware of it um, it looks like they didn't discuss his bankruptcy much but that doesn't mean they didn't discuss his finances which I think they did also think no matter what you think of Nicole Kessinger, no matter what you think of Shannon, and no matter what you think of Chris Watts, just that snippet of information rings true. It resonates. It resonates that that the bankruptcy was never discussed because if it had been discussed, then w one can imagine it wouldn't have happened again. If the bankruptcy had been an issue, then it wouldn't it would have been less likely that it would have become an issue again. The fact that it's hidden away and it's sort of hidden behind appearances makes sense and that's how it then becomes an issue again and when you hide behind appearances you simply, uh, you know, what you resist persists and so that it's no wonder that the financial situation just came back and it seems that the, the Watts family w were simply passing the buck, kicking the can down the road and sort of hoping that things would sort them out and if not just just move somewhere else, maybe you know, try a few different schemes, get new credit cards, not really paying the piper, um, just finding a, a better way to avoid it and, and um, postpone it and treat money as sort of a phantom idea that you can kind of just bullshit your way out of um, and a lot of finances are like that um, but when you play with that monster it's like it's like a fire you can play with fire and then it eventually it burns you um, it's no longer it's no longer a hypothetical thing in a controlled scenario like on a barbecue it becomes um, something that controls you the next reference um, from the discovery is where also where uh, Kessinger just says she recalled what's never told her about his bankruptcy. That's the second one. And then there are a couple more where um, I think this may have come out during the polygraph. Um, I'm saying that under correction, but in any event, um, it's stressed here that Watts and Shannon filed for bankruptcy two years prior so actually it, it is actually three years earlier it was in 2015 um, and then the next point he does not recall how much was discharged during the bankruptcy that is um, interesting um, it's interesting because what's is quite an intelligent guy in terms of money and in ter sorry not money um, uh, uh, num numerics and I wouldn't say math but remembering certain sort of details um, so it's strange that he doesn't remember that maybe he does and he's not saying or maybe he didn't know maybe um, to some extent Shanann's control of that meant he was sort of locked out of that equation so to speak but that that also makes sense that resonates why a bankruptcy would happen again you know if you don't know how much you owed or or what the cir circumstances are then it's, it is likely to um, repeat itself very um, crucial here is that he knew when the kids returned to school that Monday the Monday of the murders that they would be living paycheck to paycheck. So in the same way that he wanted his life to continue with Nicole Kessinger, he also knew that the day the kids went back to school, um, he would be hamstrung. He would be in a situation of um, financial austerity. Um, just going quickly through the rest, uh, Shanann took out a $10,000 loan 
to catch up on their mortgage they were behind on their mortgage and the mortgage payment was due uh, we, we know all this the mortgage payment was actually due I think the day after Watts was arrested so um, also Shanann's paycheck would have come through on the Tuesday and so with her dead on the Monday meant he could theoretically take her money on the Tuesday and try and bail himself out of the situation. Um, he may have felt that Shanann just didn't know how to sort of sort out the finances and if he didn't sort it out they would lo he would lose his house maybe as he saw it and so he wanted to take control of that. Um, they had received a letter from Chase Bank pertaining to the delinquent home loan. Bear in mind it's in his name, so w whether or not they considered the house theirs and whether or not um, Shanann contributed to the home loan, which it looks like sh effectively she didn't because the checks weren't even going, you know, um, not only with it was the mortgage mine, but even the checks for the um, home association were going to apparently the wrong address. So. Um, he, w he he admits that he and Shanann were stressed out about their fi financial situation and we get a glimpse of that stress when we look at that statement uh, Trinastich made um, Monday afternoon where he said, you know, he often heard them flat out screaming at each other and especially him. Well, what would he be so upset about except the finances? Um, and it's possible that the trip to North Carolina was Shanann's attempt to sort that out. Maybe Shanann thought, well, with a baby coming along, she needs to um, boost her business. And in the sort of multi-level marketing psychology, maybe that made sense to do. In terms of what she actually got out of it, um, that's, that's another question. The problem is we, we, we don't have a piece of paper giving us exactly Shanann's financial records and so we can the best that we can do is speculate but what we do know is how Watts felt. So we can say Watts is wrong. We can say Watts didn't know Watts lied that 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 um Shanann wasn't spending more and Shanann etc etc. Um but if we go down that route, then we also s admit that we don't know, we don't know why they would have argued about that. So what were they arguing about? Um, and then he currently has two thousand dollars in his Chase account, uh, and approximately one thousand. That, that's not no money. He, he had some money saved. It would be interesting to get that from Shanann. You know, how much money did she have? And we know that her credit cards were. Bouncing. We, we know that the night of her murder, her credit card was denied. So, so just in terms of that little snapshot, we, we kind of get a sense that Watts himself was in a better financial situation than she was. Um, the fact that the house was in his name and not hers also seems to con firm that uh, perception then it also says almost all of their credit cards are maxed out um, Shanann had only been paying the minimum amount on their credit cards and I think that really says it all is you know if Shanann was only paying the minimum it was because they were only capable of paying the minimum Shanann was only capable of paying the minimum and the credit card bouncing showed that she is wasn't even capable of the min minimum and this is when she came back from um, North Carolina so you know if, if anything um, you know if the business had boomed things should have been better were they um, in the CBI report um, the word bankruptcy comes up twice um, it has to do with questions around the realtor and around the selling of the house and in this instance Watts said he never thought he and Shanann would have to file for bankruptcy 
so he was shocked that this happened most of the bankruptcy dealt with credit card debt from their wedding so it shows you just how long the debt happened and what's interesting about the wedding was that that it was all planned by Shanann um, so you know one imagines a big a big bash and then I mean the irony couldn't be more cruel is and twisted is you you have all this effort going into the wedding which then infects and contaminates the rest of your marriage the, the wedding is supposed to set you off on your way and then the debt of the wedding um, sort of hangs over the, the marriage I mean it's, it's it's really unfortunate but that wasn't all they had a lot of doctor bills from the girls always getting sick I've had a lot of pushback from people saying no the, the children were just as healthy as anyone else or it's normal for children to be that ill um, similarly in the John Bernay Ramsey case people say John Bernay wasn't sicker than usual um, people can have those arguments people can make th those arguments and say well no 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 the girls were completely healthy why did they end up dead no the girls were th completely just like any other other girls well they weren't they were murdered by their father so there was some situation there that wasn't like the average and people can then make the argument and say well yeah, it's got nothing to do with that Chris Watts is a psychopath or Chris Watts is a narcissist. That's why it happened. Well, that's not that's not um, anchored in the discovery. It's not anchored in the reality of the case. Uh, you can you can say you believe that and maybe it's true. But um, the same with John Bernay Ramsey. Um, you can say, well, she wasn't um, less sick than any other child and she wasn't bedwetting anymore. You can make that argument, but unlike other little girls she ended up dead um, so so if you say well her the fact that she wasn't sleeping well the fact that she wasn't well the fact that she was often sick that had nothing to do with why she died okay then make that argument then what did and then is there what's that o what's that answer so that that's that's sort of true crime rocket science is we're trying to anchor what we know in what we know or what we think we know not in just well I think an intruder broke in and and question mark right so that's what we're trying to do here and um, I think it's I think one area where we've got to be careful taking Watts's version is he doesn't want to disclose his motive so he doesn't want to talk about the money and so where he says he didn't have access to their bank account uh, on his cell phone and never asked Shanann to see their account. That's possible. What isn't the sharpest tool in the shed in many respects. I don't know if I believe that though. Again, one must say, why w was Shanann murdered? Why did she need to be murdered? Wasn't it because he did have access to their bank account? He did know what was going on and, and, and he, he, he had maybe access to it, but he didn't have control. Shanann had control. He may... He may have, and what I mean by that is he may have been able to change the transactions and change the payments, but if he did, Shanann would have sort of read, in, read him the right act. So he had access, but um, not control, and to regain control, he, needed, he felt he needed to get, hold, uh, uh, get rid of uh, Shanann. It doesn't make sense that he would never have asked to see the account and that's another aspect that's missing from all the telephone transcripts that we look at is you never see them really talking about money except where Shanann complains that she's been busting her butt in North Carolina you don't, uh, you know, and also Shanann complaining that he spent something you don't really get and also complaining about how much the parking costs and all that so you can see that was true. Um, Shanann was aware of how much they were spending, um, but it takes two to tango. Um, if anything, they sh th she shouldn't have gone to North Carolina. She shouldn't have gone on the Thrive um, thing. They should have, and they sh should have taken their children out of that expensive school, and they should have um, perhaps 
should have should have changed jobs. Um, anyway, that's maybe a discussion for another time. Um, I do feel personally that Shanann holds a bit more responsibility for the financial situation because she took responsibility for the finances. So the one in control of the finances was in control of the finances. The one who was responsible was responsible. And so the fact that the finances were the way they were, I feel the, the responsibility shifts to some extent to Shanann, just my opinion. Um, one could argue him having an affair, that, well, that's m 10 times worse, and that's true, but their financial situation was as bad as it was before the affair, before those six weeks. Their financial situation, their bankruptcy in 2015 had nothing to do with that affair, had nothing to do with the, that six-week period. So that's really the issue. Um, yeah, so we do know when he worked for Longmont Ford, he would just bring Shanann his paycheck. And again, you can say that's probably not true, but it is. Because we know that uh, the, the, there are um, reports in the Daily Beast from his boss at the time who said Shanann wore the pants and he would hand over his pay paycheck to her. So, you know, and one could also make the counter argument and say, well, shouldn't he have known better? Shouldn't he have known better to just not give his money to her? And I think that is part of the mechanism, the dynamics and the psychology of the murder is, yes, I think he knew that. He, he couldn't just keep giving control to her. He couldn't just keep giving the, his paychecks to her. And that's sort of how he, I think he started putting money aside and how he started... Um, sequestrating his finances and trying to create a secret financial life and a secret um, financial exit and that then becomes everything else the affair and also um, you know in order to divorce without alimony without financial hemorrhage in, in, in order to cut those strings um, that's 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 what made him think murder was the best option for him. So I think the financial narrative is really important, and the financial narrative really impacts the um, relationship dynamics in a big way. Which brings us to when Watts was talking about relationships um, several years earlier. I think he was married. Um, Yeah, so at the time that he made the video about relationships, um, Watts had been married for a couple of months, uh, if that. Um, it was made in 2012, and the Watts we see there is a different animal to the Watts we know now. He really looked like a kind of a... Joe Public, uh, just, he just looked like a very ordinary guy, uh, he looked like a mechanic, he, he looked like, um, you know, um, just an average Joe. So, we see, we see him wearing glasses, we see him looking a little overweight, uh, we see him with a kind of a stringy goatee, and um, yeah, he's... Um, fairly reasonable and he in in how he conveys himself but he's he looks he looks uncomfortable um and he's, he's also got a little bit more hair on his head than than he had before and he's got no none of that sort sort of silver on the sides um, at that point he wasn't a father um, he didn't have a terrific amount of experience on relationships and i guess what followed showed that also um, that's another aspect to address is you know um, when two people get married uh, how does the impact of the one having more experience impact the other who has less so um, in, in, in any event um, at around about 5 minutes 45 seconds in the clip um, where Watts is talking making his um, presentation on relationships and he was doing this at work simply to it was, it was a um, 
exercise he was doing to help him become more comfortable talking to the public. So it was an assignment given to him to sort of address his introversion, I guess. And the topic uh, either given to him or the one that he chose was talking about relationships. Um, it's an interesting question whether he chose the topic. It would make sense that he did, given that this is very close to him getting married. So, so more than likely he had researched this anyway, and more than likely he was thinking about it anyway. And if he was getting married, he may have thought of himself as something of an expert on that. <laughs> so, yeah. So at, at five minutes forty-five, uh, what quotes Bloomstein and Schwartz? Uh, saying when a relationship breaks up it's normally the more attractive one that leaves. Now also bear in mind that Shanann had been in, in another marriage and with a guy called Leonard King who's a lawyer and it may have been Watts' perception that Shanann left that marriage because she was more attractive or that he was more attractive or that she was more attractive and left their marriage for someone who she thought was more attractive, if I can put it that way. I'm not saying that Shanann, um, that there was infidelity there. I'm not saying that. I'm simply saying that Shanann may have left the marriage because she felt her partner was less attractive or something. Uh, but then there's also the, the dynamic that uh, when Watts asked her about a marriage and why it didn't work out, um, he may have gotten the just the perception that 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 Shanann was more attractive, um, or that that was the the scenario. That's totally speculation, but um, uh, but it's something we're going to certainly discuss in terms of the w the Watts family and why this particular affair happened. You know, was this also a case of? normally it's the more attractive one that leaves. So we want to think about that as well. Um, interestingly, when Watts says that, he then shrugs, saying he's not sure whether that's true, um, which I think is also very interesting. He mentions it, so it's important enough to mention, and then he sort of undermines it by saying, well, he's not sure if that's true. Um, is he saying it because he's sort of intuiting what his audience is projecting onto him, or is he saying it because he doesn't believe it in terms of himself um, or is he saying it because of he doesn't think it's generally true and interestingly I think um, that says so much about this particular case is what's saying well it's the, the more attractive one that leaves but he's not sure whether that's true I mean that that contradiction speaks so well into this particular case it would be interesting to hear what you think about this, so please leave your comment in the comments below. So, um, I do want to drill down into specific and direct comparisons now when we deal with the Watts case. And I understand, again, that this is kind of a sensitive area. And what we want to do is... Um, take the Watts case and then apply it to sort of general information and then sort of apply it to some extent to ourselves. I don't want to do it the other way around. I don't want to apply ourselves to the case and that's how we understand it. I want to first look at the case on its own merits and then through um, through Watts's own um, example, through Blimstein and Schwartz, what do they say? And then And then we can maybe talk a little bit about our own um, experiences because that's also valid but what's most valid is looking at Watts and Shanann through Watts and Shanann not looking at Watts through ourselves and Shanann through ourselves and looking through Shanann and Watts through whatever relationship we in that's not going to give us any information and a lot of the commentary and social media and the um, just the discussions are invariably everybody else projecting everybody else's lives onto these people and saying well that's what happened <laughs> no, that's not what happened that's what you see happened what we need to do is say that this is ex this is what happened in terms of these people and then take that into our lives and say oh you know what 
this is what I can do, uh, this is what I recognize in myself or in my partner, and, and have that discussion in an honest way. Not have it the discussion of who the watches were from our perspective, because that's meaningless to other people. It's meaningful to you, certainly, and that's important. But we're doing it in the wrong direction. I hope that's clear, and I, and I don't mean that in a nasty way. I just m I think it's... Um, uh, error in the way that we're thinking is we we start from ourselves when we when we should start true crime rocket science starts with the dead body and the evidence and the facts of the case and the dynamics doesn't start with the person who is you know um, studying the case and it shouldn't so um yeah so the if we t if we just juxtapose two photos of Shanann, the last time we see her alive, and Chris Watts, um, the next day, um, literally the next day, and within feet of each other, you know, they're both on the porch. The one is um, at 1.48 in the morning, and the other one is probably Tuesday afternoon. Um, but you basically see um, Shanann obviously it's a bit unfair to her she's arriving back from the airport but but this is how we need to see her we need to see Shanann with her guard down and you know just what is she like when the cameras are off her when she doesn't expect to be in a video made of herself by herself or a selfie that's going onto Facebook to self thrive products when she's unexpectedly sort of caught on camera th that is also how she's experienced in the home by her family and so when we see Shanann um, in that picture she's sort of dressed very casually for someone coming from the airport um, very sort of um, informally and um, Shanann doesn't Sh Shanann somehow looks different to how we've seen her all the other times she looks um, she looks less attractive, just to just to be very plain about it. Um, she looks quite plain as well. Um, again, just to be sensitive to her, she's had a horrible weekend. She's been stressed. She's, you know, it's two o'clock in the morning. Who does look great at that time? Um, you know, she hasn't had sleep. She's pregnant, uh, for goodness' sake, and she hasn't been. She's not well. So, but the point I'm trying to make is, if you just take the last picture of Shanann, that was that was how she appeared. How attractive was she when um, when Watts was having his affair? Well, this is this is how he saw her when he was with her. And then, if you look at a picture of Chris Watts next next door, he's quite. And bear in mind, he he just appeared. It was just after the sermon on the porch, so the situation's different. It's daylight, and Watts is um, obviously, um, you know, he's going to appear in front of the media, so he probably wanted to appear, um, y y you know, kind of well groomed. Um, in any event, uh, he's he looks quite, um, even though he's also casually dressed, he looks quite. Um, well taken care of. He's uh, he's tanned. His appearance is neat, and um, <coughs> and physically he's in a sort of a good place. He's strong and he's in good shape, and he's fit. He's physically fit. We know he was fit. We know he was running. And if we compare what's just in on those terms to Shanann, Shanann wasn't well. But she was sort of not well, not just in those days, but over a long period, she, she was often not well. She was often complaining about her health. Um, if we just compare Shanann to, to her husband, even, even w what she would have said during her um, videos, um, she, she commended him for how much weight he'd lost. Um, you know, he'd lost more weight than she'd lost. She'd also lost weight. And in a way, the pregnancy just skews everything because it's not a fair comparison anymore. It's not comparing apples with apples. Um, but but I think it's 
nevertheless relevant to say even though she was pregnant and you can say well that's not fair that was still reality so as she was becoming more pregnant maybe uh, she was becoming less attractive and I mean that in a in a in a sort of a global sense um, you know he was becoming more frightened of her and of the situation um, you know, and then the, 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 the physical and um, psychological and sort of temperamental changes that people go through when they're pregnant. So it's not a it's not a indictment of Shannon at all to say, you know, you know as she became more pregnant, you know, did she become less attractive? Think about all couples. Any couple where someone becomes pregnant, um, you know, do they become, you know, <laughs> more prickly to deal with, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? Personally, I find uh, pregnant women very attractive. I think um, there's a lot to to love about the whole situation, and I think there's, there's some men who who sort of like that idea of the wife being, I don't know, more dependent on them, and also just just that whole situation is a, it can be the most happy time of someone's life. Of course, it can also be. Even in just any other couple, it can be the most miserable time. You know, some women handle pregnancy better and some men handle pregnancy better and vice versa. So that's really the conversation we're trying to have. We're trying to have it about Chris Watts and Shannon Watts, but without being sort of um, ugly about it. We, we, s- we want to look at them sort of at face value and we want to acknowledge them as people. We don't want to be nasty about it. Right, that's what we want to do, and then we want to bring it back to society and ourselves, and, and see where that takes us. But we don't want to make this about us or society so much. We want to understand this case, so that's where where we want to sort of keep it. And that brings us to three specific areas um, where we sort of analyze this whole idea of who's more attractive than the other. And I think it's very important because. You know, whenever people have a relationship, it's not about, well, I'm more attractive than you. It, 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 it's about we the same attractive. It's about compatibility. So when people choose to be in a marriage or in a relationship, they're saying, we have these areas in common. And that's, what, that's the glue that holds them together. So they say, well, our attitudes to money are the same. Our attitudes to work are the same. Our attitudes to sex are the same. Our attitudes to ourselves are, th- are similar. Our attitudes to each other are will work, right? And it's when one or both start seeing that the attitudes aren't the same, that's where problems emerge. So where one starts to say, well, I'm more attractive, or, or this is different or better, that's how relationships cannot work. And that's why this conversation is so important, to say, who is more attractive between... Um, Shanann or the mistress it's a symbolic question because we, we're asking the same thing of ourselves compared to some outsider taking away the love of our lives it's also a symbolic question in terms of you know, how, how do you handle these various issues and, and it's also a test on these things of you know how do we, how attractive are we in if we test ourselves on these things and in a weird way, and maybe in a way that's not very edifying to us or society, is we look at Chris Watts and Shannon as kind of classic, almost fairy tale characters where we look at them and we say, we judge them and we evaluate them, and that's a safe place to do it. And that's why I think this would have made such an important court case, because I think the whole of America could have looked at them and said, well, gee, guys, let's stop paying so much attention to appearances and let's sort out our money and let's sort ourselves out and let's sort out our problems in a way that makes sense you know without murder and without let's try and do things the right way and and why and also why can you not just get a divorce you know why do some people who stay married they don't kill each other but they stay married why do that why can they not get a divorce and maybe Maybe there there are things that need to change to to help make that happen. There, I saw a quote the other day um, where someone said, "I think it's Willie Nelson said, um, why do people get expensive divorces?'" And answer because it's worth it. 
you know, so even where people have a lot of money, uh, they're willing to look at um, look at Jeff Bezos um, was willing to spend billions uh, to get his divorce, and he felt it was worth it, right? So let's go into the three sexist areas when it comes to, to couples, money, work, and sex. Um, and these three areas, uh, we, we're not just plucking them out of the air. Um, it's mentioned in a New York Times article from quite a long way back, October 1983. So quite a few decades ago. And... Um, it may seem as though that's too long ago, and we'll see whether that's true. I don't think it's not true. Uh, some of the truth may have changed, but money, work, and sex are still three very vital areas in relationships and in our lives. And um, in that New York Times article, they, they referred to couples are happiest where they are the most equal in power and in the freedom to... Um, initiate sex and in decision making so in other words what they're saying in a very general sense is um, where couples sort of feel that they're sort of equal in power um, and they both have the freedom to initiate sex so the so whether the one wants or the other um, they sort of you know the one one can ask another one says sure let's do it and and so that's that's equal in power and then decision making as well and um, they and what that's really talking about is control, um, that they have equal control over everything. And now one might say, well, that was 1983, things have changed. Uh, couples aren't happy, they don't want to be, I don't think that's true. Might be, my, things may have changed, but um, if we take just that idea into the what's marriage, and we say couples are the happiest who are equal in power, well, were they? Were they equal in power? They, they certainly weren't. If this is a case of anything, it's a case of, which is kind of unusual, is a case of a very strong, um, powerful woman, um, a woman who's very self-possessed, a woman who was controlling a lot, a woman who was calling the shots and wearing the pants, a woman who was taking in the paychecks and deciding how that that would go. Um, so Shanann was equal. Um, not equal in terms of power. Um, Chris Watts was there was definitely not equality for him. Um, in fairness, um, the relationship was set up where Shanann was more in charge and Watts was less in charge, and and there are some relationships that have that dynamic and it works. So where they are not equal, and where someone is sort of where the the woman is more in charge and the husband's happy with that. And that does look like that's how that relationship started. The issue is probably um, there was a time where it crossed that line where um, the amount of control and power what was willing to give up became unacceptable. And the amount of power and control Shanann took started crossing that line where she was imposing it more than that he wanted it and was happy with and so I kind of got the sense watching a lot of the videos that when she did some things that he wasn't happy with she kind of almost scornfully said well he does what he says and you know uh, he, he likes that and I, th I think she maybe got a bit carried away with that idea I think she um, there was a point where that was true and then she uh, was I think abusing that um, and I don't use that word lightly I, I do think she was abusing that um, control and his introversion I think she uh, simultaneously despised him for it and took advantage of it and the problem there is, I think, just not understanding how introversion works. But I'm not going to talk about that here. Um, going back to the New York Times article, uh, they talk about um, husbands and wives who do not believe that marriage should be forever, um, and they are less willing to pool their money. And this is a 
issue that I mentioned earlier is, you know, if if what started suspecting that the marriage was going to end, and we know that as early as March, April, even Shanann was aware of divorce being on the cards, and and this technically predates the affair. Um, uh, you know, this technically seems to indicate that both of them were aware that things weren't going well, and and maybe incredibly the decision was to have a child and that would fix their feelings in any of it which I mean from both sides it's a terrible decision given their money um, malaise but the issue is here that if Watts suspected the the marriage wasn't going to work then we can see how he would have moved his money to one side and um, that would have, and and what we see with that is also um, a lack of equality in power. I mean, why would he need to do that in the first place, right? And we know that he felt very unhappy about the money. He felt very unhappy about how it was being controlled. And so, you know, w one um, constructive argument for you know how why why couldn't he have just gotten a divorce or how could they have sorted this out? Is if um, they could have sorted out the money thing where if Shanann had said, you know what, let's try and sort out the money together. I'm going to give you access to the bank account. I'm going, let, let's let's work together on this. So, so, you know, how could Shanann have arrived home that night and survived and not been killed? Um, I know it's reductionist to say this, but can you imagine if she'd sent him a text saying, I want to talk about the money. I want to sort it out. Would that have changed anything? Would that have, um, you know, if Watts was sitting at home premeditating and he got that text saying, I'm going to, you know, let, let's... I think that, that would have been a factor, but the, the gender reveal was perhaps even a bigger factor. And I think that says something about Watts, that that even his focus wasn't enough on the financial situation. I think the financial situation was fraught, but um, he, his brain was addled by other things. Uh, back to the New York Times article, married couples who disagree about the wife's right to work have less stable relationships. Um, I think there could have been a lot of enmity about what Shanann did for a living. And in that case, I may be projecting my own... Um, bias against multi-level marketing. Um, I lived with someone who did it for a living and, and sh she always struggled and she um, I read some of the scripts that she had in a file on what to say when people objected and, and I was just very aware of how um, dishonest, duplicitous, manipulative and just weak the whole thing was and, and um, so so I lived in, in that situation for, this wasn't a partner of mine, this was just someone that I sort of lived with. Um, she had four or five years which where she didn't work another job and she always struggled financially. She had very wealthy parents, um, but, and she was also involved not just in one multi-level marketing thing, but several. So. And uh, according to her, she worked very hard, and she ma she did work quite a lot at it, but she never had any money. Um, so, so I remember thinking, if we were in a relationship, if I was in a relationship with this person, I would have expected her to stop doing that. Um, and. And 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 um, I could see how that could have caused problems, um, but I can also see if you didn't sort that out, how that would that would uh, create even bigger problems. So, <coughs> um, in terms of this article, they're actually talking about that sort of 80s thing where women wanted to sort of have the right to work and, and you know it was early in, in that whole conversation. This isn't about that, this is about what's not liking the kind of work that his wife was doing, potentially. 
to be honest, I don't get that impression from him, which, if it's true, doesn't reflect very well on him. I don't really get the... I, I get the impression he thought Thrive really worked and, and that, you know, um, that they could make money out of Thrive and that... So... So... Um, it may not be that as much. It may just be that Watts didn't like being associated with Thrive in the way that he had to be. He didn't like appearing in the videos. Um, he didn't like that aspect. And we know that he, 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 he didn't really. He was sort of an unwilling participant. Nevertheless, you have you have kind of an unequal relationship and a, and a less stable relationship because the one one um, the one side the the one side of the equation in terms of the couple isn't um, so good for the other. And we might also say, how did Shanann feel about her husband, you know, working in the oil industry? Um, one thing we do know, Shanann didn't like uh, what's parking his car on the driveway um, because it could wake the chore and uh, what could leave oil stains. Um, that's just a really weird scenario where you know he's a former mechanic and you don't want him to park his own car on his own driveway um so that's that's really weird uh, another thing that's weird about watts himself is even though he works in these sort of gritty industries he's he's always clean i mean even though he's a mechanic even though he worked in the oil industry he always seems to appear very well groomed compared to if you imagine any other mechanic or any other oil work and we've seen some of the some of the pictures of his colleagues um, that they look less well groomed than he does put it that way um, then it also talks about um, heterosexual women are attractive when they have more varied sex lives um, I don't think that applies here that much I think it applies more to him um, you know Watts was having a more varied sex life than Shanann was and um, but even before the pregnancy um, one gets the impression again that Watts may be lying um, but you, Watts said that he you know um, it didn't seem like he had an active sex life with Shanann um, whereas he had a very active sex life with Kessinger. Now, when you talk about that, Shanann has a different story. She talks about him not being able to keep his hands off her and so on. Um, again, that's a subjective view. My, my impression is that Shanann wasn't as interested in sex as he was. And isn't that why he was in the affair? So that's how I would look at that aspect. Um, and then another aspect in the New York Times article for all types of couples possessiveness escalates when p one partner fears the other might have a meaningful affair and the other emphasis is on the word meaningful and this is the part that I feel many people have really missed is you know was it a meaningful affair or was it just a meaningless affair and when people are dismissive and they say, well, Kessinger's not even attractive and she's got an irritating voice and Shanann was so much more attractive. Well, the question is, was it meaningful to them? Was it meaningful to him? Was it meaningful to her? And it was. She was Googling wedding dresses. She was invested enough that she was sending photos of herself to him regularly. Um, she was invested enough that um, she was trying to help his, him with his diet, um, that she even went to his home, um, that they went camping together, and, and that's a scenario that can really um, blow up in your face. You can go camping and have a horrible time. It seems like they had a wonderful time. Um, so... And we did see that possessiveness did escalate when, when Shanann feared that Watts was in a, an affair. Th there's no question from her whether she never got to the point where is he with someone else and it's meaningful. She never had that thing. And that's, I think, a fault from her side. Um, 
and I say this with sympathy, but I think, I think only I think in the weekend before her death did she think for the first time, and and maybe in the week before her death I think she thought for the first time, what, what kind of person am I? What what kind of person is he experiencing? And she used these words herself. She said, sometimes I can be a bitch and sometimes am I that controlling? Th that was a very meaningful conversation to have because if someone's having a meaningful affair with someone else, it's because they, they're experiencing things in a meaningless way with the particular person they're with. And they, they, what they're not getting with that person, they can get with another person. And if Shanann had you know, maybe really thought about it, she may have thought, how meaningful has it been for him being with me? Has he really been? Has he really enjoyed the chores and the being ordered around and the control? And you know, and there's a there's an aspect where we're just reactionary. Where if someone says something, we respond. Do we? We don't. We don't sort of hover above the situation and see ourselves in it, and see how that that whole. You know, when you have a relationship, you have the reality of one person, you have the reality of another person, but you have a third reality, which is the reality of the relationship. And sometimes we don't float above the relationship to see it in those terms. Um, another aspect brought up is a fixation on beauty, making it difficult to create a stable relationship. And that's another aspect that's very contentious and maybe one we can discuss in another episode is who was more focused on beauty? Was it Shanann who, who was you know, all about wellness and all about these products? I mean, Thrive is all about a fixation on beauty. It's all about losing weight and having a better lifestyle, having, having the appearance of a nice car. And you know, if you take the whole mendacity of multi-level marketing and promoting something that's not the case, even when she was losing her family, she was talking about how happy she was and how she was thriving. And that is a fix that's the definition of a fixation on beauty. To, to, and it's a fixation on beauty to sell things. And, um, you know, one, one explanation for why this murder happened, one could say that all three people in this... Um, situation were fixated on beauty. Um, Shanann on her, her own and, and on her business. Chris Watts on himself on, on losing weight and becoming this silver fox. And Kessinger becoming kind of interested in what she was looking more attractive. So all three of them were, were kind of fixated on beauty in a sense. And so when you have that kind of shallow thing, um, bad things can happen. And I mean social media is replete with a fixation on beauty. We're not going to go into too much detail on work we have already, but in, in terms of the New York Times article, something that's interesting is, and bear in mind this was written in 1983, um, women, lesbian or straight, don't like to dominate. And they don't like to be the more powerful partner, they don't like to feel more superior, they want balance, they want equality. Um, one could say that's not relevant in this case. Um, one can say that Shanann didn't want to dominate. Shanann didn't want to be the more powerful partner. She didn't want to feel superior, that she wanted balance. I don't think that's true. I think Shanann did want to dominate. She dominated her friends when they had, you know, Thrive Live, and if Nicole didn't want to go on, she would make them go on. And so, you know, and the whole thing of influence on social media is about dominating. It is about promoting it is about power it is about being superior well I you know I know about thrive you know talk to me um, right so um, but it, it is interesting this idea which kind of feels quite old-fashioned today that even um, lesbian women don't like to dominate they don't want to be the ones initiating sex um, it just seems to be a thing that's innate with some women obviously not all I also think that some of Shanann's resentment for Watts was that she eventually found herself in a situation where she was dominating and she was the more powerful partner and I think 
sometimes she felt well I don't want to be this I need you to step up and and have some game I, I need you to step up and do you get what I'm saying and um, so in a weird way she created this sort of situation uh, but then she couldn't uncreate it or she didn't know how to uncreate it and that's also a very interesting um, psychology is if you're in a relationship with an introvert and you start dominating him more and more and more how can you change that like how do you get the introvert to be less introverted and and I do talk about that in the books and that's that is a fascinating discussion in terms of sex um, um, I, I've mentioned that is that the balance of power even with lesbians um, they resent being in a more powerful role so, and so I think that is really quite interesting um, I think um, sex is also about power and I think whether what's acknowledged it or not in his marriage he did want more power and so he got more power out of the marriage through sex right I also think in terms of Nicole Kessinger she gained such a strong stranglehold such a strong hold over watch through sex through all those photos that were sent so so that's quite that is definitely an important um, conversation to have as well um, something else to mention this also comes from the New York Times uh, men homosexual or straight want to preserve their power and dominance they care about their, the partner's looks and they are less relationship centered than women um, so this gets to the whole idea that it's not being about being relationship centered um, it's about sex right um, and I, I do think that that was more the case potentially with uh, his mistress that that it was more of a sexual relationship but um, I wouldn't say that it would end there I think I think Watts did want a relationship with her he was having a relationship with her sex had was a big part of it but I think even both of them were in that sort of hot period of you know steamy sex which then you know leads out of the honeymoon honeymoon period and and the honey leading it out of the honeymoon period was what what's wanted um, and that's when the murders happened and it, it never eventually got there um, this has been over an hour uh, so I'm gonna go very quickly through um, uh, Bl Blumstein and Schwartz um, I just think it's important to mention that these were people that Chris Watts um, referenced in his speech on um, on relationships so let's just spend a little bit of time uh, talking about this he may even have read the book that that we're gonna talk about now but Blumstein and Schwartz were sociologists at the University of Washington in the late 60s 70s and early 80s Blumstein and Schwartz had begun studying sexual behavior as early as 1972 it's, it's uh, conceivable that this book American couples was in the it was like a paperback lying in the household in Spring Lake where Watts grew up. He, he, he may have read it um, at home um, for, for all we know or, or shenanded. Um, Eleven years later the researchers collaborated on a book simply titled American Couples and Philadelphia Inquirer called it a major enlightening report on how Americans live their private lives. Um, it was described as an explosive study by two doctors and and it on the cover besides uh, American couples in blue were the words money work and sex in red um, when we just go through the New York Times review of that article in 1983 um, they were saying that um, you know Tolstoy believes that happy families are all alike that and that every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way but the truth is the opposite Un unhappy families are alike in highly predictable ways the partners quarrel relentlessly one bullies or tyrannizes the other both put their selfish interests above their mutual interests as a couple 
They have affairs. They disagree about power. They care about transient values such as beauty more than enduring ones such as commitment. So, you know, if we, there's so much to talk about there, but, um, you know, we, d we do know that they were quarreling, uh, even though that was sort of kept um, secret in a sense. And we should also talk about the fact that both of them put their selfish interests above their mutual interests. So, you know, you could say that what's having an affair was, was doing that. But you could also say that Shanann's obsession with Thrive and social media and and just 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 that was it was a selfish interest Shanann promoting that was kind of a selfish interest and you know when you look at a lot of photos of Shanann and her family and Chris Watts it's always Thrive related it's always got some sort of spiel related to Thrive it's never um, it's never sort of I wouldn't say never but it's seldom Shanann just enjoying being with the family or Shanann just enjoying being with her her husband you see that but if you compare that to the images of Chris Watts um, having fun with his mistress um, snow uh, sandboarding in in a national park in the out in nature you compare that to thrive patches everywhere and 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 I had a happy day unpacking this and and it's thanks to thrive all the time just not very um, it's not very meaningful and it's not very touching it's not very uh, there's, there's not much humanity in, th in a situation like that and that's just not very attractive at the end of the day you know if all of your interactions are monetized if all of your in interactions are on social media it's just not very attractive um, and that's a, a big difference between um, between the two What's also interesting is how they talk about happy couples differ in their own way. So it's not that if you you must be the same in order to be a happy couple. Um, I'm just going to um, go into one of the authors, Philip Blumstein. He was a social psychologist skilled at analyzing everyday encounters, friendships, and business relationships. He was hired as a psychology, sorry, a sociology professor at the University of Washington in 1969 and became renowned for his research in human sexuality and relationships. He had a reputation for fastidious method methodology and a talent for interpreting data. And I really respect that. You know, I've already had comments and criticism for, for the few YouTube videos I put up where people say it's psychobabble and it's, you know, I think you're making it too complicated. Relationships are complicated. Marriages are the most complicated relationships we'll ha ever have, the most complicated experiences we'll ever have. And when you add chore into it, even more so. And we don't understand them. You know, the fact that there's so many divorces and, and the fact that this case ended as in such a devastating way is because they didn't understand their marriage. And so we do need sociology to understand our society. We do need professors of psychology to understand our society. We do, we do need um, fastidious methodology to figure out how all the details and to put them all together and then to interpret the data. We, we need all of that. So it's not psychobabble. You know, we do need to understand ourselves, and, and, and that's known as the science of man. And that's, that's the, um, that epitomizes true crime rocket science, right? And that's uh, Blumstein. The other one, uh, Pepper Schwartz. Um, you can read about her on Wikipedia. Uh, she's still alive. I think um, Blumstein died in 2016. Pepper Schwartz is an American socio sociologist and sexologist. She teaches at the University of Washington in uh, Seattle. She's the author or co-author of numerous books, magazines, websites, uh, website columns and a television personality on the subject of sexuality. Um, this Wikipedia entry also mentions her as being well known for, for collaborating on her book with Blumstein, American Couples, Money, Work, Sex, which surveyed lesbian couples, gay male couples and het heterosexual couples. Um, you can watch a presentation that 
Pepper Schwartz gave uh, for TEDx on the next sexual revolution. Um, I'm not going to go into it any further, just to say that the fact that Watts mentioned these people um, isn't only relevant to Chris Watts, but it's very important to true crime rocket science, is we do need experts in psychology and we do need experts in sociology to understand the behavior, not just in the true crime sense, but in terms of these marriages and what happened here. And that's a big thing that's missing in these debates. So let's let's answer the question. So when we say um, when a relationship breaks up, is it normally the more attractive one that leaves? And, and I would tend to say th that that's true. And I, and I would say I think it's simply true that Watts was the more attractive one in the shallow sense. He was the more attractive one physically. He was fitter and, you know, in, in the, the scenario of the workspace, he appeared attractive to Nicole Kessinger. Um, Shanann also seemed to defer to the fact that her husband was looking really good and she even took photos of him working out. You could flip the thing and say, well, did, did Watts take photos of Shanann? Um, I don't think so. Maybe he did, but I don't think so. Did Shanann take nude photos of herself and send them to her husband, um, you know, like prior to the... Well, you could say, well, they were married and they were children, um, but I think you get where I'm coming from. Um, he was definitely the... Um, at the time, he was definitely more physically attractive and physically fitter than um, Shanann. And you can try and imagine Shanann at those sand dunes also sandboarding. I just can't imagine her doing that. She wouldn't want to get dirt on herself and she wouldn't, I'm not sure if she would want to do that to begin with. Um, just very quickly in terms of work, money and sex, and I'm not going to answer this question, I want you to think about it yourself, but if you take just the thing of work, who is more attractive in terms of their jobs? Um, Watts was a oil worker, but he was bringing home a regular salary, and he had a work vehicle, and he ha was capable of sort of holding down the mortgage of the house to some extent. Um, certainly, that he could get finance, you know, that he could put the house on his name. But in terms of work, um, that was his job. Shanann's job was um, selling powders online and putting patches on herself and turning her entire family life into an ongoing commercial. You know, she was doing, that, doing it constantly. She had to move her entire family to North Carolina and then also to going on that Thrive conference when so much was happening in her life. So, so was her work really delivering? Was it really that good? Was it fun to be around someone doing that, you know? Um, so in terms of work, who is the more attractive in terms of that? And Another way of answering that question is if, if you imagine someone on social media being attracted to Shanann, you know, thinking she's an attractive woman, would they put up with sort of bumper to bumper Thrive promos all the time? And when you talk to her, oh, uh, d d can I sell you some Thrive patches? You know, someone's trying to get to know her as a person and maybe is attracted to her sexually, but she's only going to be sort of selling thrive patches and, and her social media is just going to be that all the time so I think that's also something just to consider um, in terms of the money side um, you know um, Shanann felt that she couldn't afford to be divorced from her husband because she couldn't afford to raise three children so even that seems to be an acknowledgement that he had some he had a strong a stronger financial position or a strong financial position but just think about the two in that respect. Um, you know, how attractive would it be for you to be with a woman who controls your finances or, I or a man who controls all the finances and doesn't let you have a say? It's just not an attractive situation. Um, but in any situation, a person who has quite a lot of money is more attractive than a person who either has no money or who has debt or a person who has horrible attitude to money or a person who can't manage money so so that's that's worth looking at and then in terms of sex who was the more sexually attractive who was the one that was having more sex 
and now we get to Nicole Kessinger versus Shanann Watts and I'm going to go through this very quickly because I don't want trolls and I don't want I don't want this to be the f the full focus of this discussion but we do need to have it so I've juxtaposed a picture of Nicole Kessinger um, taken about two weeks before the murders and and then Shanann and, and just put them side by side I don't think it takes a genius to look at those pictures and say well um, you know, it's quite unfair to Shanann, but in terms of just th the appearance, um, not with if you're a woman, but if you're a man, uh, how would you feel, you know, looking at that? And that's just the physical appearance, and that's all we want to look at there. We want to say, well, physically, um, you know, how did they match up at the time that this happened? It may seem like a cruel question to ask, but it's also a pertinent question. Is how did you know why did Watts make the decision he made how did he make it that formed part of it and it's un and it's, it's un um, doubtedly a shallow question and it's a shallow answer no one's saying it's not but we must also get back to the fact that when um, people try to get information on this case everyone was interested in how Nicole Kessinger looked and so and so and so was Watts. Watts was also obviously interested in how she looked, and so was Kessinger. She was interested in how she looked. That's how so our society works. So, so to be sort of take the high moral ground and say, "Well, that's uh, it's disgusting to even think that way." Everyone thinks that way. You know, when you decide to marry someone, are they attractive enough for me? Um, am I attractive enough for them, etc. If you take the next set of photos um, and you look at just the personality of Shanann and the personality of um, Kessinger, some people can't stand Nicole Kessinger's personality and everyone's different, certainly. Um, but if you take Shanann's personality, she what we do know about her was she could be, be very moody, she could lose her temper, she could be very angry. And wh when that wasn't the case, there was a lot of just Thrive-related um garbage monopolizing who she was so thrive kind of cannibalized shenan's personality everything just became thrive related whereas with kissinger if you weren't at work you weren't at work if you weren't at work it wasn't on social media if you weren't at work you could go and do something together and enjoy yourself and you know if we also take the um money debate um if we compare Shanann's finances and her ability to manage them to Kessinger's, um, how do they match up? Kessinger had a full-time job and she, according to her, it was her dream job. She was happy at her work and she was earning a living and she was living independently. Um, Shanann was dependent on her husband for money and if they'd gotten divorced she couldn't have imagined looking after herself or her children and many people are in that situation so just in terms of that wasn't Kessinger in a better you know in terms of that wasn't Kessinger um, financially more attractive we don't know Kessinger's financial situation but th that doesn't seem to be an issue anywhere so it may be but it doesn't seem to be um, we also know that when sh when Kessinger sort of sailed down that sand dune Watts was sort of moved to say, well, so damn sexy. Was he saying that about his wife? You know, when he was with his wife, was that happening? Um, obviously, at some point in their marriage, it was, and then at some point in their marriage, it wasn't. Uh, another image which also feels is very unfair um, is when we look at Watts with Kessinger at the sand dunes and, and out in nature together, and then we've seen the video of him with his kids on the beach and it's very stiff and it's very sort of overshadowed by what we know is coming but it's also just there's no spontaneity there's no um, warmth between anyone really the children are sort of randomly running around they don't seem to be interested in their father they don't seem to Watts is reaching out to his, his daughter all the time and she's um, pulling away all the time. Um, 
th there's a little bit of fun with the children themselves, but um, it's not a situation of the parents and the children having fun with their children. And uh, I, th I think we can't be sort of honest about this discussion without bringing it down to one simple question and one simple answer. So again, we've given the whole spiel, which is important to give, but I think we need to also drill it down to a simple question and a simple answer. And the simple question is, who ultimately was the more attractive partner? So between Chris Watts and his wife, who ultimately was the more attractive partner? Given what happened to Shanann, given what Chris Watts did to his children, I think the answer is clearly that Watts wasn't the better human being, that Watts wasn't the nicer human being, and that Watts ultimately wasn't the more attractive person. In terms of Nicole Kessinger versus Shanann Watts, who was the more attractive, I think it's irrelevant what we think. Um, I think the most important aspect is what Chris Watts thought, and he made his choice between Nicole Kessinger and Shanann Watts. And, um, and that's really what matters here. Um, What's unfortunate is the way that he made that choice. As soon as we talk about the way that he made that choice, I think we get into the even more sort of, it's like a minefield. It's, it's walking a tightrope to even talk about this. But when we say that Chris Watts made the choice that he did, we tend to focus on Chris Watts and say, wow, you know, um, he's a psychopath and what an idiot and what a stupid thing to do. But we're forgetting that it's, w that it's a situation of him and his wife. And we can only truly sort of fathom the dynamics of that motive when we also see um, what he saw, if we also see the person that he was dealing with. And when we also sort of uh, try and understand that um, this was really about regaining control over his power and um, if he had never lost it to begin with and if, if he had never lost it to the extent that he had um, the, the, this crime would never have taken place and that brings us to the, the really the end the end game which is <coughs> um, you know one can imagine the responsibility in terms of the introvert not to give away his power. I'm talking about real people in real mar marriages. The introvert has a responsibility to to set boundaries and to maintain their their sanctum sanctorum, so to speak. But I think the shenanigans in those kind of marriages also have a responsibility not to trample over the quieter. Um, personality that they're with. Someone who's an introvert doesn't mean that there's no inner world. Someone who doesn't show emotion or doesn't communicate it doesn't mean there is no emotion. It just means that they're not as comfortable. In fact, they may have more emotion. They may have, they may be more uncomfortable about communicating their feelings. And it's a misinterpretation to suggest that someone who you know in in a society that encourages all the self expression that that's a normal person and that's and that's um that's the way it should be but then someone who doesn't naturally do that someone who's naturally quieter um one then dismisses their inner world and and that one can then impose your inner world on them or expect them to express themselves in a, in a similar way it's quite a complicated thing but i think one thing we can learn from the Watts case is we could look at Shanann's situation and say, was there a way that she could have changed her control over her husband? And what was that way for him to regain a certain amount of power and, and regain a certain amount of control without resorting to murder? And that we...